Hey guys, this video is sponsored by SteelSeries, so make sure to stick around after the end to find out how you can get a discount on your next order. It's not every day one of your favorite games turns 20 years old, but here we are with yet another game I spent a significant amount of time with in my youth, reaching a substantial anniversary. Yeah, the game I'm referring to is Return to Castle Wolfenstein, one of the best of the old school first person shooters, and one that still kicks ass, even now in 2021. Which is both worth celebrating and musing over, reminding me yet again just how old I'm getting. I mean, man, I'm getting old. I don't have time for this nonsense. At a time when a lot of things in modern gaming kind of suck. What is that? I can't think of anything better than taking some time out of my schedule to go back and reminisce about the better times, the simpler times, back when you bought a game and the game was good. Ow! And if all you want to know from watching this video is whether or not you should go back and play this thing, well, let me save you 20 minutes of your time right now and say that the answer to that question is a resounding yes. yes! You can pick this thing up for about six bucks on goodoldgames.com, then download something like IORTCW, drop those contents in your installation folder, and you're good to go. You'll be kicking doors open and shooting super soldiers in the face in no time. Ow! If you want to stick around instead though, well then get psyched and let me explain why I still love this thing so much. Return of Castle Wolfenstein was actually one of the first reviews I ever did for my channel, back when my microphone sounded like it was made out of a tin can. I always look at Return of Castle Wolfenstein as one of the last true old school shooters, and it's really one of the last titles from what we PC elitists refer to as the golden age of gaming. <laughs> Man, you are one pathetic loser. It might have been one of the first games I covered, but Wolfenstein 3D on the other hand was one of the first games I ever played. It's often regarded as the first first-person shooter, where you navigated these maze-like environments, shooting Nazis with a pistol, an MP40, and a chain gun. And although it's aged about as well as a political take on Twitter, for the time it was groundbreaking stuff. Aside from the cutting-edge graphics, it was also the first time I'd ever heard proper digitized sound effects. Things like voices and screaming. And in particular, the sound of a door opening was a big one too. I mean, not only was it a telltale sign that someone had come into the room, but it also helped to raise the tension if you couldn't see where that person went. And it might seem kind of funny saying it now, considering everything that's come out after it, but back then it was really like I was playing a horror game. Wolfenstein 3D's level design often used these tight, cramped environments as a means to let the AI get up nice and close and surprise you. The damage you took was amplified the closer that someone was. So coming around a corner and being face to face with even a basic grunt meant that potentially that guy could wipe out your entire health points in a single shot. Then the further you got into the game, the more outlandish that things became, that rhymes. Involving mutants and themes of chemical warfare. In the sequel, Spear of Destiny, they take that element even further, introducing supernatural themes. With the conclusion for the whole thing even taking place in hell against the Angel of Death. Overall, they're fun games with a simple premise, though they are definitely dated by today's standards. And they're kind of pale in comparison to the accessibility of their successor, Doom. But that concept is still pretty tight. You've got a World War II military-themed shooter combining elements of science fiction and the supernatural. Sounds like a pretty good mix to me. It's like brunettes and glasses. And I guess that Grey Matter Interactive thought the same thing because in 2001, they unleashed Return to Castle Wolfenstein on the world. And yeah, what a day that was. It's a reboot of Wolfenstein 3D, and one that's still arguably one of the best reboots of all time. I mean, I think the only thing that beats it is Doom in 2016. Grey Matter Interactive were no strangers to the first-person genre either. They'd worked on the Redneck Rampage series along with an expansion pack for Quake 2, and also Kingpin Life of Crime. A really awesome and for its time innovative shooter, which has to hold some kind of record for the amount of four-letter words that people use in this game. I'm prepared to scour the earth for this motherfucker. It also showed that these guys were no stranger to working with id Tech, which is kinda handy because Return to Castle Wolfenstein runs on the Quake 3 engine. And I can remember thinking that this was about the best that video games were ever gonna look. 
Medal of Honor Adelaide Assault came out around that same time period, and between Return to Castle Wolfenstein and that D-Day mission in Allied Assault, I honestly thought that this was as good as graphics were ever gonna get. Yo. And also just compare how this thing looks to how Wolfenstein 3D looks. Take a 10 year old game now for instance and compare it to something that just came out. The differences are going to be minimal at best. It's like trying to spot the differences in freckles on someone's ass cheeks. Yo. This was also one of the first games I can remember playing that had a full blown cinematic orchestral soundtrack. The music was composed by Bill Brown, who was no stranger to this kind of thing. He'd even worked on the original Rainbow Six games. And anyone who's played those first couple of games is probably gonna agree that there's some memorable tracks there. <laughs> So, expectedly, the stuff he's done in Return to Castle Wolfenstein is also pretty damn good. Not to mention, it's varied. The music you hear in the castle, for instance, or sneaking through the nearby village, is going to be completely different to the kind of stuff you'd hear deep inside the crypts when you're taken on undead abominations. Or blasting your way through these top secret labs and military facilities. I think my absolute favourite track is the one that always plays when you make it to the end of a level. It's a stinger that sounds really triumphant, but then right at the end it's got this slight dip in tone. It's kind of like the game is saying congratulations, but we've still got way more work to do. Findings which are to say the least astonishing. Return to Castle Wolfenstein also really marks a bit of a turning point in the way that first person shooters were being made. I mean, going back to Wolfenstein 3D and then Doom after it, that was really the starting point for the golden age of 90 shooters. But then it seemed around the time of Half-Life and onward, we'd start to see a shift in the way these games were being designed and also how they played. It wasn't just about finding the exit key anymore and pressing a button or flipping a lever. You were now moving through a realistic environment with an actual objective and a goal. Plus, it was around that time too that we'd start to see this rise in these more military-themed shooters. If Call of Duty Modern Warfare is responsible for popularizing this trend in the late 2000s, well, then I'd say that Return to Castle Wolfenstein is also responsible for kicking it off in the early 2000s. Not to mention, it's one of those problematic games that insults you when you try to quit. Classic. Now, I know that the game's multiplayer mode is arguably more popular than its single player. Enemy territory even went on to become its own standalone title with a fan base that still exists to this day. I mean, that's downright impressive considering there's games that came out barely 12 months ago that are already going the way of the dodo. But my praise and the focus of this video is really going to be directed at the single player campaign, which I honestly think is still one of the best the genre's ever churned out. This is a campaign that's going to leave you with hair on your chest, or if you're playing on Death Incarnate mode, maybe even a third testicle. Right from the game booting up, you get this awesome cinematic set back in 943 AD, where a badass warrior named Heinrich is banished by a wizard and sealed away for eternity. And as a 15 year old kid, this intro was second in line to boobs as the coolest thing I'd ever seen at the time. Anyway, a millennia later at the arse end of World War II, Heinrich's resting place is discovered by the Nazis, who get to work to revive him to use him for their own nefarious purposes. For a bit though, this plot kind of falls to the wayside, and you almost kind of forget about it as soon as you're thrown into the boots of our returning champion, BJ, who's gone and gotten himself captured behind enemy lines and is now imprisoned at the eponymous castle. At this point, it's all starting to sound pretty similar to Wolfenstein 3D, and the first and most obvious reference here is that the game starts with you breaking out of your cell with nothing but a knife and a Luger pistol. That entire first episode of Wolfenstein 3D was just you trying to escape the castle, all nine floors of it, before then having to kill the head guard Hans Gross, ending with one of the most triumphant ending screens of all time. Yeah! In Return to Castle Wolfenstein though, this escape sequence lasts about 10 to 15 minutes. You shoot your way out of the underground cells, then through the various halls of the castle, leaving finally on a tram before meeting up with the German resistance at a nearby village, then heading into the underground crypts to pursue the SS Paranormal Division. Fuck, that's a mouthful. <laughs> These first few levels also allow for some limited stealth, which might be some kind of throwback to how Wolfenstein 3D was originally intended to be a stealth game. 
but I also think it's just more of an illusion to BJ's status as an OSA agent, along with kind of warming you up to how these mechanics work, considering what's coming later on. Perfectly here, Oberführer. The whole second episode in the village in the crypts also happens to share the same title as Wolfenstein 3D's fourth episode, Dark Secret. However, in the original game, this episode was about taking down a Nazi general who's creating chemical weapons. The second episode, however, is about taking on these undead warriors as you pursue these Nazi zealots who all of these centuries-old catacombs. Catacombs which somehow happen to have all these modern weapons and health kits lying around in all these hidden passages. The chemical warfare theme instead returns later on, with BJ having to find and destroy a rocket that's armed with a biological weapon that's targeting London. And then the ensuing chapters involves BJ investigating how the weapon was created and who's masterminding the project. In this case, it's a creepy old dude who looks like a shriveled ball sack called Deathhead. Either an appropriate title given to him by the Nazis, or just a guy whose parents really didn't like him. Death's head is kind of like an amalgamation of two characters from Wolfenstein 3D, in that not only is he responsible for the chemical warfare side of things, but also responsible for creating these horrific mutants in the form of the Lopers and the Super Soldiers. So all in all, the guy's just a bit of a jerk. Is that understood, Major? Apart from all of that, there's other throwbacks in the way that you can eat food to regain your health, and also find secret items in the form of Nazi gold. Your primary weapon's again gonna be the MP40, and then later on you'll also get the Venom Gun, which is like a bigger, badder version of the Chain Gun from Wolfenstein 3D. Just like in Wolfenstein 3D, you'll only start off with a knife and a Luger, but that's a roster you're gonna add to pretty damn quick. The knife is actually something that's always going to be put to good use here because if you ever manage to sneak up behind someone without them seeing you, you can then backstab them for an instant kill. The pistol though is pretty dreadful and it's kind of similar to the pistol and the chain gun in Doom in the way that they both share the same ammo. Instead of the chain gun though, in Return to Castle Wolfenstein it's an MP40. And yeah, once you find this thing, the chances are you're never going to use that Luger ever again. Filling in the same slot, you've got the Thompson submachine gun, which, keeping gun nuts happy, uses a different ammo type entirely. And in what I think is an even more clever attention to detail, ammo for this thing is virtually non-existent. Which actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, why would the Nazis keep ammo lying around for a caliber they never even use? Same thing for the Colt pistols, which use the same ammo as the Thompson. I mean, they're about as rare as hen's teeth, whatever that means. But the brief times you get to go hand with both of these weapons is a lot of fun. It's just a bit of a shame the Nazis weren't considerate enough to leave crates of 45 ammo lying around for BJ. Then there's another weapon which probably caused the blasted butts of gun nuts all around the world when it came out, and that's the silenced Sten submachine gun. A silenced Sten submachine gun. Yeah, I just said that. And the reason I say this is because for some reason this thing overheats in a matter of shots, at which point it can't be fired. And I think that's about as realistic as if the gun also fired out fart gas. Thankfully though, this limitation also applies to the enemies, which is handy considering the enemies that use this the most are those elite guards, which we'll get to soon enough. It's really just been done to make it more balanced, I guess, because if you could fire this thing full auto without it overheating, well, then you could just mow through enemies like it was nothing. So it's a sensible limitation to prevent the trivialization of the air- ah! So it's a sensible limitation to prevent the trivialization of the air's designed with subterfuge in mind. Yeah, say that sentence five times fast. That's an understatement, sir. Moving on for rifles, you've got a scoped Mauser and the Snoop rifle. The latter of which you also get bugger all ammo for, and that's ammo that you're gonna want to hang on to pretty tightly, believe me. I mean, I think there's just enough to get you through that forest level, and then later on, when you're on your way back to the castle, dealing with all these elite guard hiding in trees, let me tell you, that thing in its thermal scope is going to be an absolute blessing. Then the final rifle is the FG-42, carried by those damn dirty paratroopers, but this I think is easily the best all-round weapon in the game, which is probably why these dickbags carry them. The FG-42 I also think is just one of those really cool guns from the World War II era, along with the M1 Garand and the STG-44. It's just always been one of my go-to guns for World War II shooters, and this might be one of the best incarnations of it I think we've ever seen. The sound this thing makes alone is a thing of beauty. 
Apparently, flamethrowers were banned by the Geneva Convention, but I guess no one told our boy BJ about that, because you get to put one to good use here, and it's one of the more powerful weapons you get in the entire game. All you have to do is fire this thing in the general direction of an enemy to get the job done, setting them ablaze, which kills them pretty shortly after. And I do remember this genuinely freaking me out as a teenager. The way that the Nazis would scream horrifically as they burned to death. I mean, you always feel sorry for them. Almost. Then finally, there's the Panzer Shrek, the Venom Gun, and the Tesla Gun. For all intents and purposes, the Panzer Shrek is basically your rocket launcher, which you're going to want to save for the baddest of bad guys. The Venom Gun, though, gets a bit more mileage, and it's really good at turning enemies at close to medium range into minced meat, but it also overheats super quickly. Again, probably because of balancing, because a gun that lets you fire a bazillion rounds a minute and never overheats, well, that's going to be pretty damn broken, ain't it? Then finally, you've got the Tesla Gun, which is a weapon you get right after beating one of the super soldiers for the first time. Not only is it the same weapon this super soldier just used on you, but you also get to put this thing to use instantly against half a dozen or so Nazi scientists. The same Nazi scientists who only moments earlier were probably fucking around with you by shooting you from this upstairs walkway, which probably made that boss fight trickier than it needed to be. And it's a really good example of instant karma, getting to unleash this really powerful weapon on these assholes for some gratifying payback. Yeah, suck it, bitch. All up, it's a pretty solid arsenal, and what I think is even more atypical for the time is the fact that there's no weapon limit. Yeah, you can carry all of these things around at once, it's just a bit of a kerfuffle trying to swap through them all. There are grenades as well, though sadly this comes from a time before throwing grenades had their own button, which means I use these things less than a speedrunner uses deodorant. Wolfenstein shooting does seem a bit weird at first. You'll notice enemies shooting at you from a distance and see these tracer rounds going out in this wide spread, and if you shoot back at them, well the same thing's liable to happen as well. But I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. You see, if you press the crouch button while you're firing in this game, your accuracy becomes near perfect. And you can fire full auto with pretty much every weapon and hit dead on center each time. I don't think the game manual even tells you this, and it wasn't until a couple of years later when I found this thing out, but believe me, it makes the game much, much easier. And that's part of the weird mix that this thing has, skating this line between being a semi-realistic military shooter, with weapons and locations that look true to life, but then combined with all the other wacky fantasy and sci-fi elements with weapons like the Tesla cannon and the premise of fighting centuries-old Saxon warriors deep underground. But that's really the part of the charm, and I think even by today's standards, there's just something so unique and fun about this campaign. Part of what I've always liked about this game is how it just constantly feels like the level design is changing things up. And if it's the first time you're playing, you never really know what you're going to see next. First level, for instance, you have this tremendous feeling of just being outgunned and outnumbered. You're starting off in the bowels of the castle and have this goal to simply escape. There's no objective markers, you don't get damage indicators or grenade icons, this is old school shit. You've just got to make it to the end of the level the best way you can, taking out every single obstacle between you and that exit. As you move through these early levels, you can choose to get by without being seen for a time, but it never outright forces you into staying hidden. Alarms can be tripped off by enemies, but they can also just be easily destroyed too. After this, you're in the nearby village and again given free reign in how you want to tackle things. A mounted machine gun lets you wipe out a small group of approaching enemies, and there's plenty of items inside the various buildings if you take the time to explore. Not to mention from this level on, you've also got that silenced Sten submachine gun. A silenced Sten submachine gun. From here though, it takes a massive shift and now you're in the crypts. They've sealed this in here. If you're unfortunate enough to play this as a 15 year old kid like I was, well, what came next would have really caught you off guard and probably scared the absolute piss out of you. Yeah, piss would have left your body. Now the mood is a lot more sinister and the music becomes tense and foreboding. You've gone from taking on Nazi soldiers in broad daylight to suddenly taking on the undead in these dimly lit flickering hallways. Zombies fire out floating skulls and undead warriors are armed with shields that can even deflect bullets back if you're not careful. Now it feels like you're playing as Indiana Jones, dodging booby traps and collecting treasure as you navigate these eerie corridors. I think you're really just better off running past all of these things, but even that makes for some harrowing sequences, as they keep popping out of coffins and coming from around nearby corners. 
It then arguably throws one of the hardest sections of the game at you, where you're now taking on the leather-bound elite guard. Enough of your styling! Yeah, the badass Nazi bitch is covered head to toe in leather, leaving only breathing room for their abundant cleavage. Armed with those silent Sten submachine guns, don't say it, that shred through you like a hot knife through butter. And again, the game has changed things up, and it almost now becomes a bit of a tactical shooter, peeking around the corners and waiting for the right time to fire back at these bimbos. I've always kind of wondered too if these enemies are inspired by the assassins in Half-Life. I mean, both of them use a silenced weapon, and they both have these very blatant clacking high heel sounds when running towards you. Then it's all finished off by a boss fight against a horrific monster that looks like a walking stack of piled up turds, in the remnants of a cursed church. Now consider that this is just the first two chapters in the game. We've still got five more to go after that. Enough of your styling. The third mission is really the first real filter for the game, and it's the infamous stealth mission in the forest as you're trying to sneak into a rocket base. Along with remaining undetected and avoiding alarms, you also need to find your lost equipment which is scattered around the place as well. It's a daunting and overwhelming task, and the size of the environment is much bigger than anything the players moved through previously. <laughs> Now, I might be a bit biased here because I've finished this thing more times than I can remember, but I gotta say, I really don't think it's as bad as people make it out to be. The issue, though, is that it is easy to get yourself into an unwinnable situation, especially if you're safe scumming, which can force an entire restart. You don't often know if someone's going for the alarm until it goes off, and if you quick save just before this happened, well, then you pretty much screwed yourself over. But I think the stealth mission later on in the game though is even worse. This is where you've got to kill five SS officers all in one go. And if you don't know where to go or what to do, well this whole level can be an absolute labyrinth. The second filter comes a bit later on in the third mission when the paratroopers show up, even having their own entrance music like they're WWE wrestlers or something. I've always said that the music that plays when you first encounter these guys is the theme tune for when shit gets real. And from this point on, expect to see a lot more of them. The way these enemies show up I think is also a good example of the way in which the game is always managing to introduce a new threat per mission. I mean, it's so subtle that you might not even notice it, but your brain did. The first mission, for instance, introduces the basic soldiers, right? The second introduces the elite guard, the third one introduces the paratroopers, the fourth introduces the lopers, the venom troopers, and the uber soldiers, goddamn. And then the sixth one introduces the super soldier. And then from that point on until the end, you're expected to handle a combination of everything you've tackled so far. I mean, you go from fighting guys armed only with MP40s and Mauser rifles to suddenly fighting guys armed with FG42s, guys with miniguns and flamethrowers, and then these walking tanks armed with miniguns and rocket launchers. And it all happens so seamlessly, it's just a perfect ramp up in challenge. The Uber Soldiers and the Super Soldiers are definitely some of the toughest enemies in the game, and they come in two different variants, both of which can fucking ruin your day. Not only can they fire off rockets and their minigun without any kind of wind-up, but the super soldiers also have a goddamn Tesla cannon. Yeah, that ain't fun either. But you're never forced to fight any of these guys in unbeatable situations. You're always given the option to break line of sight, and their dummy thick hitboxes make it more than possible to just chase them from around corners. The Lopers, though, are by far the worst, and one of the few mercies this game has is that you only have to fight them a couple of times in the entire game, but that's almost two times too many, let me tell you. Now, you first encounter them at a secret weapons facility, and then later on at the X-Labs. Both instances, though, involve these things breaking out of confinement and running amok, so either way, I hope that the Nazis have taken some notes about both of these events and stopped putting these things into production. Then again though, they are Nazis, I mean common sense and rationality weren't something those guys were known for. Wolfenstein's real test though is the second last level, the literal return to Castle Wolfenstein. But I really do think this level is the definition of artificial difficulty. So this is the level right before the final boss and you're mostly just taking on more zombies, but also a final battalion of elite guards and paratroopers. And although these guys are visibly wounded, I mean, you can outright see the injuries on their character models. For some reason, the level designers thought it made sense to give them more health points and turn them all into John Wick or Jane Wick, I guess. 
I mean, the paratroopers in general often have around 70 health points, but for this final level, it's up to around 150. Dealing with the zombies is made a lot easier this time because of the flamethrower, which just absolutely shines when put up against the undead. But this last gauntlet of Nazis is one that always manages to kick my ass. And every single time I come back to this level, I always have to spend a few more quick saves here than I'd care to admit. The difficulty modes here mainly affect how much health and ammo you get from pickups. It doesn't affect the intelligence of enemies or the damage they do. So regardless of playing this on easy mode or hard mode, this section is always going to tear you in your asshole. But hey, I mean, no one said saving the world was going to be easy. It almost makes the final confrontation against Heinrich seem kind of tame in comparison. Once all is said and done and you've sent Heinrich to final death, you've finally beaten one of the best FPS games of all time. Congratulations. I'm sure he understands, sir. Instead of taking some time off for R&R &R and banging strippers like Duke Nukem did, our boy BJ just gets right back into the fight like an absolute chad. But the war is far from over. And it's the legacy that Wolfenstein left after this game that's kept it relevant for years to come. Two years later, we'd get console ports for both the PlayStation 2 and the Xbox with Operation Resurrection and Tides of War. And aside from porting over the original game, they also had some really unique mechanics and features of their own. For starters, both versions have a prologue episode called Cursed Sands. Taking place in Egypt as BJ and Agent 1 are chasing down the SS Paranormal Division. It's again kind of similar to the second mission in the base game, as again you're moving through a village before then heading underground, where things take a supernatural turn and you're now fighting undead creatures. This time instead of zombies and warriors though, it's basically mummies. And it all ends with a shootout against some of Helga's elite guard. I really like this whole episode too, and visually it's kind of creative. Leaning heavily into the culture with lots of unique architecture and cool looking hieroglyphics and statues inside all of these ancient Egyptian tombs. It's a vibe. This whole episode then ends with BJ and Agent 1 having their plane shot down and crashing near Castle Wolfenstein. Bring them back to the castle at once! Which then seamlessly leads into that original first episode when you're having to escape. From this point on, the differences are minor, but still pretty unique. On the PlayStation 2, there's a whole new level here as you escape this extended dungeon sequence. And then once you reach the village, there's another new series of environments with entirely new objectives. You can also upgrade BJ's health, ammo, and armor capabilities by finding secret areas on all of the levels, actually kind of giving you a reason to go snooping around for this stuff. The Xbox version, though, keeps it almost identical to the PC, though, with the main difference being that they give you this utterly broken shotgun when you reach the main village. I always thought it was a bit of a weird choice to not have a shotgun in the original game, so in some way, I guess this kind of makes up for it. So overall, these are pretty solid console ports, and the little features that each version has really, I think, makes them worth playing if you've got the original hardware lying around. It's the direction this series went after this, though, that's the real hot topic of discussion, and it seems people either seem to love or hate the games that follow. In 2009, Raven Software took a stab at it with Wolfenstein, yeah, just Wolfenstein, which was a semi-open world game with an upgrade system and a bunch of outright superpowers for BJ to use. Overall, it's not an amazing game, but it's definitely not worth half the hate that it got. Not to mention, it also brought back Hans Gross as one of the main antagonists, which alone makes it worth the price of admission. Guten Tag. Guten Tag. Just good luck finding a copy of it though. Then after this, Machine Games took the reins with Wolfenstein The New Order, The Old Blood, The New Colossus, and Young Blood. Now I think that The New Order and The Old Blood were fantastic. They managed to balance that combination of exposition cinematics and gameplay really well, offering up some challenging and incredibly visceral combat. Topped off with a soundtrack by Mick Gordon when that dude was absolutely at the peak of his game. The Old Blood in particular has some of my favourite shootouts in the entire franchise and it fully embraced the series schlocky roots with a plot around zombies and ancient secret societies. <laughs> Regardless of how you feel about these new games though, I dare you to say something bad about Return of Castle Wolfenstein. Yeah, go ahead, say some shit bitch, I double dare you. 
Return of Castle Wolfenstein is one of those games that I feel I enjoy more every single time I replay it. And although you could use the argument that I only enjoy it because of rose-tinted nostalgic glasses, I'd kind of counter-argue that that's the very thing that still makes it so good. I mean, there's plenty of games that I loved as a kid that I can't even play anymore. But a game that you can still play through, regardless of what year it is, and still have a good time, is something that's worth taking note of. I couldn't tell you anything about any of the campaigns in any of the Call of Duties that have come out in the past decade or so, but I could describe almost beat for beat every step that BJ has to take in Return of Castle Wolfenstein in painstaking detail. And I'm sure that in another 20 years, I'm going to look back on it even more fondly. A silenced Sten submachine gun. Right, so if you're still watching, well, thanks for sticking around. And let me give a final shout out to my sponsor, SteelSeries. SteelSeries makes some of the best gaming peripherals from headsets, keyboards, mice, and gaming pads, all synced together with a handy program that lets you modify the hell out of them. I'm a bit of a stickler for high quality mouses and keyboards, and whether you're playing a game that's eight months old or eight years old, it makes a huge difference in how well something handles. I would never recommend something that I don't use myself, and I'm pretty stoked to be able to offer a discount to people looking at buying some new gear. So just make sure to use that Chad promo code GMAN at checkout to get 12% off your next order. And as always, thanks for watching.